thanks everybody for being here. So I'm Charles and this is my colleague Ritesh. We're from the data platform team at Leaf, which is basically the centralized data for data team to support all data inquiries for our internal engineers, users, and to access any data within Lyft. So, so today we're gonna go through uh, two major parts. First of all, I will introduce you all the high level uh, thing and the challenges about Lyft uh, uh, while using Trino. And uh, apparently we have some new features and really cool stuff delivered this year and I want to introduce that. The second part, Ritesh gonna go through uh, Trino ETL at Lyft. Uh, we all know Trino is pretty fantastic uh, tool for smaller queries and uh, we've been exploring and asking if we can do ETL with Trino. So here we might bring you some cool sort hints, awesome answers about the ETL with Trino. So first of all, uh, of course, uh, how Trino looks like uh, within our company. So horizontally, there are four parts you can see. First part, uh, uh, as you can tell, there are like Airflow, you, you may know, Java SDK, Python, Tableau mode, which is also for reporting. So those are the, all the clients we are supporting uh, with Trino at Lyft. So basically, that's all the user interfaces we, we have at Lyft, and uh, Trino is supporting all of them here. And second one is called Mozart Gateway, which is, uh, you can imagine that's a, a master gateway of every single query, not only Trino, but also Hive, Spark. So remember, we are, are one team called Data Platform, so we can take this leverage and uh, build this uh, master gateway so we can easily uh, route from here to anywhere we want and do any kind of migration and exchange when we have to. And the third part is the uh, Trino environment we have. Uh, we have our Presto proxy, which is basically a fork of uh, Presto Gateway. Uh, some of you already mentioned uh, that Presto Gateway was authored by our team originally, and now it's open source. So we are just building a layer on top of it to make it more specific to our Lyft business. And uh, it's very important because the way we're running at scale is very uh, kind of complex, uh, different use cases, different users, different teams, and we have different SLO requirements for different use cases. So we really need a, one intelligent proxy on top of it to making sure we wrote the right query to the right place at the right time. And uh, after the proxy, in hand proxy, we have a bunch of, uh, we call routing groups or like types of clusters. For each of group, we have multiple clusters. Uh, ad hoc, obviously for interactive queries, we have ETL, schedule, which is for reporting and some other groups. Uh, and uh, inside, uh, no surprise, we have Trino with uh, all the basic stuff here, and our Trino is working on Kubernetes, uh, eventually backed with uh, AWS uh, Gravity Insist, uh, which is very powerful and cost efficient. I would recommend an anyone using uh, older version of it, just go to Gravity for your Trino. And you see I just uh, made a little patch here this morning, which is our auto scaler, so we're not uh, last year we decided not going to the Kubernetes horizontal auto pod, pod auto scaler. Instead, we de developed our own auto scaler. And later, I will t tell you why we decided this and what's our uh, advantage we, we got from this. And uh, yeah, some other uh, connectors and story we have. Something to mention is that Google Sheet is becoming really popular, surprisingly to me. Uh, uh, we all we all we are talking about Esberg, Parquet. We know we are engineers, but you know our users they really love Excel. So uh, yeah, this is a perfect interface, and people really love it, and very easy to use. Some numbers uh, to give you an overview of uh, the data we're running. So we're basically running, on average, uh, two hundred fifty. 50,000 queries a day. We have uh, 2,000 identical usernames. Uh, probably not that many users, but uh, usernames. 
and uh, we have uh, 10 petabytes daily data read and uh, 100 terabytes daily data write uh, with Trinos. And we're using, uh, right now it's about uh, 500 uh, R6G instance with another 250 uh, C6G for compute uh, heavy interactive queries. Uh, I still remember last year, same time, we probably have uh, over a thousand of such nodes uh, to deal with the same volume or even less volume. So our new features this year is really helping us out uh, dealing with more data with uh, much less uh, overall compute resource. And uh, operations we have, uh, we used to have over 40 clusters uh, within 15 routing groups. For those of you who may know Trino too much, you, think, you may think this is a fancy number, but uh, for those who've been working with Trino a lot, you know this is a really headache number. We don't want that many clusters. So every time I went to on-call, uh, be the on-call engineer, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to deal with those 40 clusters and guess which one gonna fail tomorrow. Uh, today it's much better. We are on our way consolidating clusters to a much small, smaller number uh, because we are capable and we have a much more system uh, reliability. Uh, yeah, so we want more clusters. We are not promoting for, we want, we want less clusters. We are not promoting for more clusters. And uh, yeah, as I showed, we have eight different clients. That's uh, basically all client, all data interfaces we can have within Lyft. Uh, yeah, and uh, something to bring about is that uh, for those uh, two, 250,000 queries a day, uh, most of them probably 200K it are interactive queries. By that, I mean uh, P90 will be within a few minutes or even within one minute. So really interactive queries with human users or SDKs. However, we do have uh, less than 100,000 queries about ETL queries, and we give them pretty long execution time, up to four hours, uh, including the queue time. So query could run really long here with a lot of uh, uh, resource. And uh, also we, we have a Spark team, uh, which is uh, actually still our team, my team. So we're running both Tree and Spark, and we are, we're fighting each other. Uh, <laughs> now, so I, I know all of you are gonna ask, uh, how, how do you compare Trino Spark when do you make the decision? I think the situation for us is that Trino adoption was really well for Lyft uh, many years ago for interactive queries. Our team is actually called the interactive team, it's actually more than that today. But uh, Trino was built for interactive queries and it's super well received and people naturally get adopted to ETL with Trino in, within Lyft, which is uh, uh, pretty good. And uh, and at the same time, we definitely need Spark to do some heavy, dirty jobs, ETL jobs as well. So we have Trino and Spark running together. But from data, we can tell, uh, don't quote me. Uh, I won't be responsible for that. But from data, we can tell we have uh, probably two times of the uh, cost efficiency while using Trino. Uh, same for speed performance for large queries. Uh, obviously, we are not that uh, fault tolerant on Trino compared to Spark in many cases, but uh, uh, we do see some promising numbers. That's why we keep investing in Trino and trying to make it better and better, and uh, especially making Trino ETL better and better uh, within the company. Yeah, there are some high level topics about Trino, but uh, uh, for our team, our focus uh, has been really on system reliability and efficiency on those uh, like 200 or 300,000 queries every day. It's been pretty challenging for us because imagine you have uh, one personal failure, that's, uh, that's one few thousand queries and that's probably a few hundred users behind them and you're gonna get a few hundred questions in the support channel to answer. Uh, that's not actionable at all. Uh, so we have some over, uh, challenges overall regarding system reliability. First of all, we want to control the concurrency and the queue. 
uh, easier. So we do have uh, the settings per cluster on the resource groups. Uh, we all know that. But uh, that's not easy to work around with, to be honest. So every time you have to tune the magic numbers for different users, and uh, another user pump up saying, hey, we are the most important users. Give, give us like full concurrency, or full, a very large queue. And how do we do We can manually uh, go into the database and uh, do the modification. Uh, but since we are invest investing into the proxy layer, uh, something can be done. Uh, in proxy layer to make it smarter, and proxy can fully control the concurrency and, and the queue. And one thing we delivered recently is that we have a queue-based routing across uh, clusters, which means uh, clusters with a uh, higher queue uh, will be routed with less query. And one, at once, uh, one more step on top of that, we have a user-based queue routing. So for one user, if one user is fully occupying one cluster, the, the user will be routed to the other cluster for the next couple queries. So that time, uh, that way we can route our queries uh, in a much smarter way and uh, use our resource more efficiently. Uh, of course, for Trino, we always hit bottlenecks and noise neighbors. Uh, Trino is so aggressively uh, using different computer resources, which is bringing some trouble in edge cases, especially peak hours. Uh, and uh, I think some, someone mentioned earlier today already, so we have one coordinator. That's a, a single point of failure. No matter how hard we're working with our workers, how, how hard we tune our configs, we have one coordinator. And uh, once coordinator restart due to unknown reason, uh, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know, it's going to be a problem. Uh, we're going to lose a few thousand queries in a couple minutes, probably. And uh, as always, transient issues. Why my query finished uh, five minutes yesterday and take like 20 minutes today, or even time out today? Uh, all those answers lead to different root causes every time. Uh, that's the reliability. And uh, for efficiency, we all also care a lot about efficiency. And uh, you know, we know that uh, we buy more instances, we pay more money, and we get more performance, but that's not a linear, lineage, uh, linear relationship. So we really want to find the sweet point for use case, and uh, we do believe different use case will have a different position in this chart. So we want to have a mechanism to automatically find the sweet point dynamically in real time for us. In that way, we can we can just uh, be more aggressive on our performance and uh, schedule more compute power, and uh, in that we will have less clusters, less number of clusters, because we have we are maximizing the uh, a single cluster for the compute power. So for those uh, reliability and efficiency issues, we've been introducing uh, our Trino Autoscaler. Uh, so basically, what it does in high level is that it will calculate utilization score for each worker node. And uh, based on score, you can do whatever you want to tune uh, the scaling strategy. So it's kind of similar on, uh, compared to the Kubernetes uh, autoscaler, but it's way more flexible and complex. You can do whatever you want with it. And uh, we will show, see the diagram later, show how good it is. And uh, it's basically controlling the decommission and recommission of workers. And to do that, we move to clone side from uh, deployment on Kubernetes. We see another advanced version allow you to tune uh, uh, mark terminate for specific worker pods rather than randomly scale up and down for workers, which is very helpful. Uh, imagine one worker is healthy, but it's been running for seven days. If you are, uh, if you are planning to turn off worker, that's the worker you want to turn off, obviously. And uh, scaling is uh, very powerful. It has all the stats. It can decommission, can do decommission, recommission, and we we've been thinking, why don't we make it more than scaling? We make it a, a pod master of our entire cluster. So. 
whenever something suspicious happens, if you have the capability to understand the root cause, probably not root cause, but understand the reason and take action, shutting down the worker, restarting the worker, or just decommission some resources completely. In that way, we don't have any manual interaction at all, and we can solve tons of system internal errors uh, within Trino for our system, which is very helpful. And we're still uh, working on that right now to make it better next year. Yeah, this is how auto scaling works for one of the ETL cluster, as you can see. So this is uh, one week of data. And uh, if you look at one day, there are not too many back and forth means it's uh, doing some pretty reasonable scaling. Uh, and if you look at the chart, I didn't bring it, but if you look at the chart for interactive queries by human being, it's pretty obviously every, every day it's uh, have a spike uh, around uh, uh, 9 a.m. and uh, it will scale down a lot after 5 or 6 p.m. and be required overnight, which is very expected. Okay. And besides auto scaling, we have something called the replay framework. Uh, this number 39 is not our replay framework uh, lucky number. So this number was uh, the number of new releases of Trino since last November. And you can, you can just think about how many engineer sprints each, you, each of you have one year, probably 20, 25, I don't know. But imagine how can you catch up this kind of crazy amount of work. Uh, by the way, this is really good for open source community, but how can we make use of that? How can we leverage this? So every time for us, for us uh, at a very large volume, we have to really carefully uh, test the new release in different use cases, and we cherry pick our own stuff and make a package and try to build to staging and one production, all production, that whole process is taking so long and anything happened during the stress testing or verification, it will make it much longer. So we've been thinking whether we can make a replay framework to automate the entire process. What, that, what does it do is that it will take the production volume and cache it and whenever you want to do Let's say uh, upgrade, it will take the new version of upgraded uh, Trino cluster and the replay our, uh, for example, our benchmarks or even production volume uh, there uh, in the new, uh, new cluster uh, with the new Trino version. And we have the replay analytics service generating report. So you can easily tell for this new version, is this, is, are there like a, uh, voluntary or not, and uh, is it a good? Is it as good as it promoted? Like Starbucks saying, this is we pr we make it ten percent faster. Is that true? So you can easily tell uh, if that's the case in uh, with this replay framework. And moreover, uh, not only for you know new version upgrade, uh, we all we've been all working on different configs for different use cases. Uh, your memory, your GC, your threads. And uh, that always that's changed over time. So every time we test with such a framework, we can just have one engineer test for probably one day and uh, get a very concrete result and uh, finally conclude what we want to do next. Uh, yeah, and uh, remember I, I said we have a master gateway within our team, routing not only Trino, but also Spark Hub. Imagine if we have replay replaying Spark volume on Trino, or you're replaying High volume on Trino, then you're gonna know how you would do migration when you want to deprecate High, when you want to move around some ETL use cases between Trino and Spark. This, this will be more than helpful to do that and give pretty uh, solid number to support your decisions. Uh, that's the high level what we've been doing uh, in the past to support reliability and uh, efficiency. And all we are doing is aiming to make Trino better, especially Trino ETL better. And uh, I want to bring uh, Ritesh to introduce Trino ETL in detail. Uh, yeah. Cool. Hello. Thank you, Charles. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, Trino ETL at Lyft. Uh, we actually GA'd this this July, but there have been efforts that were actually already kickstarted for trying out ETL using Trino at Lyft uh, from back in 2019. We did an alpha release for our customers, uh, a, cu a couple of uh, teams to try out in around 2020 uh, H2. And we did a beta in 2021 H1 uh, for more set of customers. So in order to actually do ETL at, uh, with Trino, we at Lyft, cost was like really important. So we really wanted to make sure that these larger clusters that we'll run for ETL, we are doing everything that we can to bring our costs down. So one of the uh, things that our compute team also uh, got piloted from AWS was the Graviton instances back in 2020, H2, something like that. And we created a plan to actually do uh, Graviton migration uh, from AWS uh, Intel uh, instances in H1. That actually resulted in 10% of hosting savings for all of, uh, for all of Trino that we run uh, at Lyft. So currently, with running, uh, currently we run 365 version uh, at Trino for all of our clusters. But how does the ETL story actually evolve at Lyft? Is it there was a, always like an internal push to try to see if we can deprecate Hive. Hive was really, really highly used at Lyft, and we wanted to see if we could deprecate Hive and try to use Trino, uh, make our workloads run faster and also try to evaluate, okay, what workloads can actually run on Trino, and if there are certain workloads that can't run on Trino, how can we make them successfully run on Spark? So this uh, especially comes from uh, data engineers uh, side where they have a high demand for faster development of uh, their DAGs, modifications, they wanna test a few things. You need, uh, people are uh, much more well-versed in ANSI, compat ANSI SQL compatible languages, so Trino SQL kind of, plugs into it, uh, that, that's why there was a push of trying to see if we can make Reno ETL viable at Lyft. Obviously, during 2019 and 2020, we did not have tardigrade. Uh, we did not have, I assume, any fault-tolerant execution at that particular point. So how do we go and try this out? Is We want to build resiliency. That's what we were missing internally in the infra. And what we did is we picked up our orchestration layer uh, so we have two orchestration systems that we run. One is Airflow and one is Flight. And we kind of built up the resiliency there. A typical ETL is simply create, insert, do a DQ, and promote it. So we, what we did was we created multiple. So as an uh, example, within Airflow, we created a Presto operator within which we developed different modes for our users to use. So if you want to go and do swap partitions, if you want to go and do insert overwrite, if you want to go and do insert append with best effort rollback, you could, we kind of created that custom code on the orchestration layer for our users to use and try out Trino ETL. So next, going a little bit deep on where we are with ETL Infra uh, today at Lyft, is we primarily run four different kinds of backends. One is for all the production ETL DAGs, things that have been well-developed, battle-tested, uh, have been running quite stably. We would kind of go and run in type one, which is our production ETL DAG cluster. There are certain high priority T0 use cases, uh, which are like core concept use cases, derived data sets for rides uh, that data engineers are probably using. That would we would run on a different cluster, but this is only due to some of the noisy neighbor issues that we had seen when we were actually doing the beta releases. Uh, with auto-scaling coming into picture this year, we might actually plan to consolidate it with type 1, uh, because auto-scaling has really, really helped us kind of tune those noisy neighbor uh, issues down even more. Obviously, there are knobs around concurrencies and queue limits which we are using. So overall, like it kind of ties very well in trying to consolidate these two use cases. I'll cover the fourth use case first. We try to keep ETL testing and DAG development as a separate backend because we don't want those queries, somebody writing a bad query uh, to kind of run along with type one or type two and kind of slow our, uh, slow our clusters or kind of starve our real production queries of any resources. Type three was a unique thing that we developed is, uh, it was more or less like an on-demand cluster. 
uh, we specially created it on the ask that people would come in that, OK, our rights data is corrupted. We need to go uh, and do a backfill of about one month's worth of data, two weeks' worth of data, three months' worth of data. Is it possible if I use the Presto operator in Airflow as an example? So we were able to successfully kind of do a battle test there with our users, kind of in some ways testing in production. We're trying to help them. Uh, and we were able to successfully run backfills for up to one year of all of our data uh, that uh, particular sets of data engineers with these core concept use cases wanted to uh, run. But this is like an on-demand cluster for us today. What does that mean exactly is we don't exactly have auto-scaling on that, but we kind of have a set min and a max. So min being 0 and max being like 50 or something. And as soon as we would send a query, we would identify, OK, there is a query in the pipe. And we would do a scale up. And the query would be in the wait for resources state. The nodes would get provisioned. In our case, Kubernetes pods would get provisioned on these nodes. And uh, we'll have workers. And that is when your backfill will run. And it would only scale down if it has seen back uh, like, let's say, in the last half hour, do I have no queries? Do I have nothing waiting? Do I have nothing queued? So at that point, it would kind of go and scale it down. So these are like the different backends that we are running at this point for ETL. Internally, we try to provide every tag its own resource group. It allows us ability to uh, give them the right queue limits. It allows us ability to uh, give them uh, right concurrencies. We do try, uh, we also tried a flavor of, we still actually have it, uh, a flavor of weighted tiering, even within the first kind of cluster. Because even within that, we kind of try to prioritize and deprioritize for the queued queries. That, that kind of helps us before the auto scaling time. Like with auto scaling time, definitely uh, the benefit of this reduces, but auto scaling definitely helps in scaling and kind of improving the overall efficiency of the clusters. So we would use weighted tiering to kind of prioritize the queued queries, uh, which were from a higher preferred uh, production ETL DAG versus something that was probably of a lower priority. Uh, the second last point is very interesting. Uh, this is a, some legacy uh, thing that we started with, uh, that OK, we'll give two hours at the max for our queries to run. So four hours being the total time that the query can spend in the uh, system, two hours being queued at the max, but two hours is what it can actually run for. Uh, not all the queries run for this long. Uh, in fact, there are very few uh, that run for greater than one and a half hours. But we are tr our push is to kind of reduce it to uh, around 30 minutes with different things, like sh using a sharding operator that I'll cover next. So best practices obviously involve communicating with the users, involving basic things around how to use joins, uh, having tech sessions with all of the users. Uh, query sharding, we use, scale, uh, we use scale writer configurations for our ETL as well. So these are like the ETL stats, particularly for our ETL clusters. We do have two and a half petabytes of daily reads, 60 terabytes of daily writes. We are at this point currently running 480 unique pipelines. Uh, all of those are heavily productionized. So anywhere like Internally, we refer to this T0 pipelines. We do also run T1 and T2s. So any of these use cases, including any right data analytics, internally, we also refer uh, it to as COCO, which is core concepts, which I mentioned. So any of the derived data sets that are being created on rides, routes, that are happening all across Lyft. Experimentation platform pipelines, uh, localization pipelines, TBS is our transit bikes and scooters. Any uh, of uh, the ETL jobs that need to run TBS has been like a very big beneficiary for their use cases. Uh, they have been very uh, successfully able to run their workloads on uh, uh, Trino. Any of our vaulting, privacy, GDPR, all of those are huge queries that run. Any of the GDPR requests uh, coming along, OK, I'm a Lyft user, please delete my entire data. Any of the legal things, litigation things that would come to Lyft if there are any ETLs running for vaulting those data, uh, that is very successfully executed today uh, using Trino ETL. In terms of volume, 60,000 queries per day, uh, a lot of these are create, selects. Not everything is an insert overwrite. But overall, the volume is 60,000. And P90 is roughly around 25 minutes for our ETL use cases. 
So we have definitely, with our GAs uh, this year, we have uh, tried to establish very uh, strict SLOs. Obviously, it means also checking up uh, with our customers to see what are their expectations, but it also means not listening to every expectation uh, because you want to kind of balance off both. So these, these are the four different uh, kind of metrics that we explicitly uh, kind of monitor uh, week over week. Uh, are on the infra side, especially how is our availability looking? That is like the most stable ever. It has to be, hopefully. Uh, but apart from that, query reliability, uh, we define it as, OK, we expect a certain kind of a query to finish within a certain time. And we create that query. We kind of check back with our data engineers probably every few months or so to see if that's the right query shape that we are still using. And that's how we would kind of measure the reliability. We have had some issues, like Charles also uh, mentioned in the last couple of years with reliability. Those are becoming better, so they are definitely on track to uh, uh, kind of m give a good measurement and also now have a historical idea about how they were doing before uh, versus how much have we improved. Query success rate, query latency is uh, pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, so these are like a typical 25 minutes thing that since September, this is our actual graph that's running in production. Uh, we try to keep it under 60 minutes. Uh, we currently are roughly at 25, so we are doing well there. So user adoption. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail about migration of of five. How, how, how has that worked? And like, what were the internal initiatives for it? Uh, we built a few pipelines around this, so not just this is not just Trino ETL exactly at play, but the pipelines around how migrations like this uh, could be done or were pitched or were tried uh, to be done. And also, I'll cover a couple of issues with this. So we used a transpiler framework that would uh, transpile your Hive to uh, Trino queries. This is one, but what happens for writes? I don't want to go and rerun this and write back again on the production data. It doesn't matter. I might end up, uh, even if it's inserted overwrite, I might end up corrupting it. So we kind of will catch the query uh, online when it's submitted. We will transpile it. We will replace the names of our schemas and prod, prod schemas and prod tables with our shadow schemas and shadow tables that we have provisioned in the background. And we will kind of do those uh, do those inserts there. Uh, after that, we so there is also a second set of thing, which is a completely different product. It has come, it has matured into its own thing uh, today at Lyft, which is our data quality framework. So you would use this framework to perform correctness and completeness checks uh, between the two data sets: the one that actually ran on Hive versus the one that we tried to transpile and shadow and kind of did this interpolation, and it finished, and we'll do this comparison. So just as a, and it would kind of generate a report off of it. So uh, trying to see, OK, if we try to automate this completely as a migration, uh, how successful we are, and how successful is Trino for these use cases? Like, do we have to probably go and tune the queries? Where are we getting, getting up? We did have some good success with it. Uh, but we ran into a few issues as well. So that's where we had the third and the sad part, which was the manual migration as well. Uh, we tried manual migration uh, working with our users as well for a lot of uh, the high use cases. And whatever didn't work in the first uh, two ways, we were able to get it done uh, with the third way. So as I mentioned, like with service level tiering, uh, mostly like we have been able to control the queue limits, uh, typical back pressure on your clients that are submitting with your queue limits uh, and weighted resource groups, making sure that our documentation and best practices are really, really relevant uh, for our users. And we did achieve a huge dent in the ETL runtimes for our migration use cases. This really was a very variable number, anywhere from 30 to 90%. We had a couple of use cases that clearly gave a 90% runtime far from five hours to about 20 minutes uh, as an ETL job. So that was like a huge win for us uh, in doing these migrations. So <laughs> covering auto scaling, I'll be a little quick. Uh, on how this has helped us in ETL, especially because ETL is predictable traffic. So any time we run our autoscaler algorithm is a function of cluster memory and CPU utilization. 
Uh, it's a custom formula. We plan to kind of tune it and make it better and better more. So anytime we see that any utilization has uh, going to spike up, we would kind of go and increase the cluster capacity. As an example, if we see here, the CPU utilization kind of is spiking up. So it kind of still remains in the healthy state because we go and scale it up. So we have more nodes, you have more capacity to kind of address those workloads that they are running. Once it identifies, OK, I am good, we kind of again scale back down. So that is how like auto scaling has really, really helped us even on ETL use cases in, in some way, specifically on ETL use cases, because your predictable workloads now, uh, it, you can kind of adjust for it. And even if those workloads change, even if you have new users onboarding, you have organic adoption or even inorganic adoption, this can cover it very well. Main challenges for us have been slow rollout. So uh, we try to do a release one half, but unfortunately this year we are only going to do one. Uh, like a couple of things is when we did the 365 upgrade, uh, we ran into, so Charles was mentioning about the replay framework that we are trying to develop, especially for writes as well. But with the reads, we already have this replay framework working and we, whenever we do an upgrade, we kind of, go historically, fetch queries, and kind of run only the read queries, at least. So it tries to give you an idea of, OK, how is your uh, test or how are your workloads uh, performing on this new, new version? So we did find a couple of regressions uh, in doing those upgrades, but like the community really helped there. Uh, we also an did our analysis with the, I wish I had better screenshots, but I can share later if anybody's interested. Uh, like couple of regressions about uh, in our releases that kind of delayed in entire rollout. So we probably took close to two months more than where what we planned, which was probably a couple of weeks, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but this is where like we are also trying to uh, enhance our testing framework, replay framework, so that not only for upgrades, if we have to backport something, how can we quickly test and have confidence that once we release, we don't have to roll back or some of our users or some of our use cases won't be uh, sacrificed. Uh, Trino for us is always shared tenancy. Uh, we have multiple ETL DAGs within an ad hoc clusters, multiple users coming and ob obviously fighting all the time for resources, as he mentioned. Uh, so ensuring reliability and continuing in this and a lot of times it's also around my query worked three months ago perfectly fine. My query was working till yesterday perfectly fine. Today it doesn't work or today it is taking long. My data model changed, my underlying data changed, my partitioning is not proper. Uh, trying to tackle those and those kinds of challenges with our users and definitely education is one aspect as well which we try to focus on with our users. Uh, accounting for organic, organic growth is a challenge, uh, trying to understand how much are we going to grow uh, in the next half versus prob probably two halves from now. So trying to kind of making sure, we always started with an over-provisioned everything, over-provisioned cluster, over-provisioned resource, uh, over resource group limits and uh, so on. But trying to kind of dial this down and really understand uh, where are our uh, like right limits and make our clusters more efficient. I covered my query slow. Let's go. Uh, where are we focusing? Uh, we are really focusing on making sure we are reliable. Uh, stats is something we want to make sure that we use the internal Trino features, cost-based optimizer and everything. But stats we had turned off a while ago because close to three years ago at least. Uh, because we had some performance bottlenecks with the kind of uh, queries we were running. But we do want to try that experiment again because a lot within Trino community has changed, Trino releases has changed in this point, and we have not kind of tested that. Uh, we are going to implement most probably next half uh, something as a sharding operator for our users. This is like a custom airflow operator uh, trying to do it at an orchestration layer for People who just have very massive queries, we will kind of do horizontal sharding automatically and we will convert one query into multiple queries uh, for them so that we are kind of able to track and make sure we are trying to hit that 30 minute mark. Uh, replay framework for writes, obviously faster upgrades. We do want to do fault tolerant execution for ETL and definitely tardigrade. Awesome. Thank you. Questions?
I think we have time for one question. Uh, what was your experience with Graviton instances? Um, I know they are a lot cheaper compared to other instances, but on the performance side, how, how would that uh, help? I don't think so. We had any difference. We, the entire migration was pretty smooth. Uh, a little bit on the provisioning side with AWS ha not having enough Graviton instances at that point when we started the migration. Still probably sometimes we run into it, but now because we have completely migrated, we actually don't know if AWS has capacity issues even on those Intel instances at that point. But when we were migrating a little bit of capacity issues, sorry, uh, but apart from that, it was pretty much smooth. And another quick question on the auto scaling cluster. What properties did you set uh, apart from CPU utilization or is just CPU utilization? Function of CPU and memory.